So I will tell you, I am struggling. I'm struggling after hearing about a little boy named Walker Beery. Walker looks like he's about eight or nine years old from the pictures and Walker has brain cancer. He also lives in New Orleans. Two weeks ago, Walker's par parents rushed him to the emergency room twice with concerning symptoms related to his cancer. And there was no bed available for him because the hospital was full of COVID patients. And then there's Michael Kagan, a law professor at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. He was recently diagnosed with stage three metastatic melanoma. The doctors told him he should have surgery as soon as possible to remove the cancer within four weeks, but his surgery has been canceled because so many beds are taken up with COVID patients. The hospital in Las Vegas issued a statement that they've had to enact their surge plan, which includes canceling all elective procedures. Apparently, surgery for stage three metastatic melanoma is an elective procedure. And then there's Dr. Nitesh Paryani, an oncologist in Tampa. This week, he had to do something that he has never done before in his career. He had to refuse a cancer patient who needed the treatment that his hospital could offer because there was no space. Dr. Paryani said, we just didn't have a bed. There was simply no room in the hospital to treat the patient. The other day, our emergency room had a 12 hour wait. This kind of strain is something we've never seen before. So I am really struggling with this. I am heartbroken. I'm angry. Angry because people are suffering and dying and not able to get care. People are losing husbands and wives and parents and siblings. Children are in ICUs and it's mostly preventable. The insanity of it destroys me. But wait, I can be even more of a downer because these days it feels like whenever I open the news, it's all just red emergency lights flashing everywhere, right? Afghanistan, hurricanes, gun violence, fires, droughts, hate crimes, climate change, voting rights. And you can add many others to that list. But COVID really makes my heart ache because we know how to largely prevent sickness and death. We know what to do to care for each other. And we're just not doing it. I feel so disheartened by my fellow humans, baffled and saddened and heartbroken and angry. Now I got my hair cut on Friday and the woman who cuts my hair, we always have a great time talking about the latest things in the news. And on Friday, we both went off about anti-mask protests and some of the vaccine conspiracy theories. And I will tell you, I may have said some things that may have been peppered with expletives. Something like that Florida governor is preventing schools from mandating masks when his hospitals are so full, he has to call in help from federal medical workers. It makes no sense. I had a lot to say about Governor DeSantis, which is very unfortunate because apparently I'm supposed to be slow to speak and slow to anger. My anger does not produce God's righteousness. I'm supposed to bridle my tongue or my religion is worthless. So my friends, your pastor is failing miserably. I am in big trouble because I am fast to anger these days, if not in a perpetual state of rage. So much inaction and so many poor decisions on so many things. 
apparently I'm not the only one who's mad. There was an article a few weeks ago titled, What to Do with Our COVID Rage. And another one, The Quiet Rage of the Responsible. And another with the title, I Am Going to Physically Explode, Mom Rage in a Pandemic. And then the one called Pandemic Fatigue Meet Pandemic Anger. Well, and so forth. There seem to be a lot of articles about rage right now. And I know, I know it's not healthy, not productive, not compassionate. Apparently it also doesn't produce God's righteousness. Yes, yes, yes. But what do we do with all these feelings? What do we do with the anger and underneath it, the well of heartbreak, despair, and grief. First, we can simply name it. We're heartbroken. Second, we process it together by showing up for worship and allowing ourselves to name those feelings together. We remember that we're not alone in our feelings, nor are we alone at this moment in history. And third, perhaps we take the advice of the author of James. As New Testament professor Craig Kuster wrote, James will insist that true faith is whatever is actually operative in your life. Faith that is not active is not faith at all. James is pretty clear, care for orphans and widows. Or in other words, care for those who are most vulnerable, care for those in need, actually do something. Feeling angry and just talking about it is not doing something. It might make me feel better to discharge that anger or blame somebody else, but it's not helping anyone, not even me. This week I stumbled on the blog of a psychologist, uh, Nick Wignall, and he wrote a really interesting essay. Part of it goes like this. He said, we spend our time consuming the news, talking about politics, and thinking about important issues because deep down we're lazy and afraid. We read the news, express our outrage with politicians, fill our minds with facts and statistics because it gives us the illusion of control. We like feeling smart and ethical and powerful, but we don't like the hard work that goes along with actually contributing to change. I felt very convicted by that. I sure do like feeling smart and ethical and powerful but it is a lot harder to do something. James says, be doers of the word. Doers of the word and not merely hearers. It's challenging, but may we indeed do our best to be slow to speak and slow to anger, to listen more. And may our religion be one of action, caring for those who are suffering under unjust systems and powers. Of course, in this way, we will make a difference. In this way, we will strengthen our own hope and bring healing to the world. We are going to be angry about the state of things, my friends, because the world is chaos right now. But we can choose to channel that anger into care and action and make a difference in building God's kingdom. Amen.